All righty, righty, righty. Welcome to Trader Tuesday. I'm going to start marking up this S&P chart real quick while you guys are getting some questions in. Don't mind me. So one thing that's just popped onto my radar today about the S&P real quick is um, this level here. I'm just going to make it red um, because it is a threat to the S&P. Um, as I have been very clear about for months here, I'm looking for, you know, swing, essentially swing long opportunities. Um, obviously, I will take short term trades. Uh, and do all kinds of things. Uh, but in terms of swinging, this is not a place for me to swing short. This is and has been and then likely continue to be here. A place to look for swing longs. Why is that? Why, why would I ever do that? Right? Well, is there more risk, right? In one direction? Is there more reward in one direction? And in my opinion, uh, the S&P is offering skewed risk reward to the upside. So that's why I'm looking for those type opportunities. And so I wanted, what I wanted to bring up to, to you guys is that this is three sessions now, right? The 16th, the 19th, this is last night. And then today's session that's holding underneath this little interesting 3930s area. This is kind of the, um, after some, you know, back adjusting and changing of contracts and rollover, that kind of stuff. This is that old 3906 that I've talked about all, all you know, for six months, right? It's been a pivotal uh, area for the year in the S&P and spending a few days below there. Um, is certainly interesting, right? So it brings about the concept for us NADRO folks around time acceptance, um, all that good stuff. So a little little late day selling here in I period as we, we push new lows. Obviously, we have the lows from the 16th and the 19th, which if, if, we, if we were to merge those, right, they would be a three wide poor low. So I period right here, taking that out, running those stops. Um, there is delta on the tape behind these sellers. So let's see what the buyers do. If the buyers respond here, um, post initial liquidity grab stop run through those past two days lows. All right, let's get to your questions. We got a bunch of them in here. Um, Matthew says he's fading my bull bias so hard. Hey, I short term, right? Well, you know, gun to my head here uh, over the next, you know, I don't know, very, very short period. Obviously, the sellers have taken substantial control. There's more... Um, downside that they can press here for sure um anyways uh tibby asks last thursday we had a great long narrative in the yes at the start of the pit session um but after some time i saw that some members of the community shifted we're looking for shorts you also took some shorts but the narrative wasn't invalidated yet Mo weekly monthly we're still rotational why did you shift bias so quickly what were you looking at last thursday Last Thursday is the 15th.
So I think the main thing, if you recall my DMIs from some time ago, so if we go back to the 15th over here, and I think I even recently reminded people about this on, on some talk or some tweet, you will recall that there was... A level like this and a level that color. You remember this, TB? TB? Remember that on the DMIs? Yes. So that was one thing that's been pressing on this market for some time was, yes, we start to get a momentum shift. Yes, we start to get value migration. Yes, there's opportunity to go ahead and put risk on for the swing long. But in the back of our minds, our analysis also shows us our next to last highest time frame for NADRO showed us destinations lower still untagged. So on the 15th, as we start to see perhaps holds below prior value, as we start to see micro acceptance picture shifts um, on various time frames, as we see the potential for stop runs, as we see all kinds of things like that, there's just things that can be done if, this is the big if here, if your process allows you to go for such trades. If you want to sit back and wait for the big, more standard all time frames kind of, or not all time frames, but your majority narrative, big picture narrative read, and that's the only things that you want to trade, then that's a style, right? If you want to be more flexible and say, well, the tape is doing this, let me go with this short term imbalance down. Maybe you only scalp it, right? From let's say DVA to the minus two or something, or a short term destination, you're taking out some lows. You know, there's ways to do that in the face of narrative. And that's one of the most complicated things I think about um, trading in general is, is for, especially for newer traders in, is to find that line, not even newer traders, right? This is more of kind of a medium advanced topic. Where can you find the line between giving yourself flexibility to go with what is on the shorter term versus maintaining selectivity around your setups and not doing a bunch of stupid stuff when narrative tells you that is stupid to do, right? So it's not an easy line to find for everyone. And that, that line is not the same for everyone. And that's important, right? So, um, you know, again, take a path, right? If you want to be shorter term and you want to be more scalpy, you can do things as long as you get X, Y, Z, right? Order flow, prior value, um, DVA, rhythm, all kinds of things like that, a little more DRO trading. And some people want to focus more on that in A, right? And they don't even use the O of, of NADRO, right? So it's a great question and it comes down to kind of uh, niche. All right, uh, Marwin. Hey, Merritt, trading time frame question. If I use a 100 volume chart, I see a clear start of imbalance to the upside. However, if I change to a 1,000 volume, I see EF sh short. Which one should I believe? I'm aware that risk measurement isn't the same for both charts, but looking to get short. Is it correct to trade the 1,000 volume? Is it okay to trade trading time frame during the session? I love this question. It's uh, really important. Um you're trading. So Marwin, what this comes down to is the fact that our, our definition of rhythm and how we read that is dependent upon the time frame that you're looking at. Look at a 10,000 volume chart and you're going to see a very, very different rhythm than a 100 volume chart. But to the second, so that's the main point, plain and simple. What you're running into is the fact that rhythm is different. Therefore, rhythm's a component of acceptance reads. It's different, right? And I know, guys, I'm talking a little nadro speak here, but this is a, a specific question, so bear with us. However, and this applies to all, everyone, no, 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 no. You don't go change your time frame just to suit your desires, right? 
just because you want to get short. You could go to a one second chart and say, yeah, it's offering a short, but you usually you trade on a three minute chart and it's not offering that. Don't do that, right? That's just a recipe for disaster. That's taking us further away from that ultimate goal, which is consistency, right? So you don't have to trade this exact same time frame every day for 20 years, right? Mine has evolved over time and does evolve. My TPO market profile tick size changes. My uh, volume contract, uh, number of contracts um, bars change based on volatility. So I'm not suiting the time frame to give me a trade I feel like taking at the hard right edge just because I want it and it's not being offered on my normal time frame. But I do adjust time frames as volatility makes major changes, not subtle changes, major changes. Uh, Hussein says, please help us with some scalping tips. Well, I mean, what can I say? It's scalping is lower time frame trading, right? I know everyone has a different definition of what it means to scalp. For me, a scalp is 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 really direct momentum. That's how I kind of define it. And that means by definition, it's usually lower time frame. So, you know, you're looking for buyers to establish control and they start to push. Momentum is kind of to the upside, however you want to read that, but on an immediate basis. And that trade is either going to go immediately in your favor or it's in, it's going to turn and either stall or go against you, which would, would result in an exit of the scalp. So that's kind of laying some groundwork here. And how do we do that? Well, for me, there's a million ways to trade, but for me, it's going to come down and rely more heavily on a shorter time frame price action, less on context, right? Like, like the question that uh, the first question we had, they're saying, hey, Tibby was saying, hey, I thought the narrative was bullish, but you and some other people took some shorts on that day. What's up with that? Well, guess what? Scalping is less dependent upon narrative. I would never, ever, ever scalp and say, I don't care about context whatsoever because context is king. But I would absolutely kind of reverse the normal hierarchy of the tools that we use, right? So therefore, what does that mean? I'm really going to focus on where we are with the DVA. I'm really going to be focused on um, what the tape is saying, what the order flow read is, right? I'm going to look with go with strength, fade weakness on the tape, monitor for absorption, strong passive participants, lean off of those reads, and then obviously short-term momentum, right? I'm looking for my usual shift in momentum, being in rhythm, things like that. Um, if volatility really, really picks up, you can get away with more breakout style trading. I'll do it occasionally, right? Shorting new lows, things like that um, as an entry tactic in a fast trend in terms of DVA reference um, versus our normal, like really looking for good size rhythm pullbacks. Uh, Daru, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, says, hey, Merrick, question on the NADRO and options regarding the art of the reentry and the chop we might get once we try to align with the narrative. Isn't it easier for NADRO beginners to trade options just because if trade works against us, we let the contract expire instead of trying to reenter if it hits our stop loss? I mean, either way, it's, it's, you're putting risk on and you're risking, <laughs> risking capital. Um, regardless of the style of trade management, but it's funny that you bring this up. Go look in our community. Me and several other people are currently having this ongoing discussion about these event contracts, right? You guys have probably seen me, the stuff I'm doing with Credelli. I'm going to be doing a Monday morning show for them. Um, and, you know, I'm going to give some picks using these event contracts, which are dumbed down options, if you will, right? You can say, yes, I think the S&P is going to close over 38.75 and you can place your, your trade there by, by just simply, you know, clicking that yes, right? And, and choosing how many contracts you want to trade of it. It's buying a call option, right? That's what it is. You're buying a call option that expires that day, right? And you're paying a price for it relative to the full value of that contract, which for these is $20. So 
It's funny you ask that because I think that a lot of newer traders and probably even more of what I would categorize into this struggling, experienced, struggling NADRO trader. I've had webinars on this in the past where we've kind of had an all hands on deck community meeting that is recorded in our community. It was a Saturday morning meeting. Go check it out. And what I said was, look, if you are using NADRO to get good reads on what the market's up to, and you're screwing it up with execution, with trade management, with getting chopped in areas, you need to, essentially what we're talking about here is widening stops. You can either trade outright futures or micros or whatever with a wider stop, right? Make your trade management entirely DVA-based instead of rhythm-based as we typically teach it, right? You could buy a call option as you just suggested, right? And avoid the chop. Now, avoiding the chop means that you're not going to buy and sell and buy and sell and buy and sell the call option, right? So there's a little, uh, you were implying something that's not necessarily the case, um, but we would we can assume that. If you're going to trade with an option, you're probably going to be more hands off. And my point then and continues to be, if you're struggling with NADRO and you're one of the people who says, my narrative reads pretty good, but I just screw up the trades. Why not say, yes, I think the S&P is going to close above 38.75 today with either one of these basic event contracts or just go buy a freaking call option, right? still want to be mindful of your risk and structure that appropriately, but you don't have to chop yourself up and then go paper trade, right? Go see if you can enhance your skills like we work on in advanced group mentoring. Go work on your short-term trading skills, be reading acceptance and where that acceptance picture changes and being uh, self-aware of that, right? In real time. Um, being able to decipher rhythm the advanced topic of medium term rhythm, right? And those the using ETH and RTH DVAs, finding spots where they're confluent in ways to, to give you slightly more higher probability entries, right? Using order flow, all these things that go into ultimately clicking the button, or for me and what I recommend, hitting the hotkey um, to time trades well. Go work on your timing skills while you allow yourself to maybe be profitable with a simpler way of trading, your narrative read, which you're telling me is really good, right? Let's see it, prove it, go make some money by trading it in a very, very simple way with a hands-off trade management approach. So I, I love the question. It really ties in with something that's going on with me right now and and something that I'm, um, have that thread going on. Get this question a lot. Brendan says, have you or any of your NADRO students that you know of completely systematized your read on the higher time frame narrative? In other words, do you have a concrete, repeatable process for ranking and distilling you talk about in the NADRO course? I have seen many people attempt it and many people come up with some really, really smart ways and kind of number-based quantitative ranking systems. At the end of the day, if you're going to give something a one through five, a particular reference on a particular time frame, at the end of the day, that is still, in my opinion, and I pray that it never changes, a discretionary read. So you may quantify the ultimate output in where you stand for the day, but each one of the little inputs that goes into that, I've not seen someone get away from discretionary doing that successfully. Um, there, I, there have definitely been people who, heck, I've coded up, um, you know, um, the, the DVA current condition and then taking trades based on that, right? So just like a basic thing. And you could apply that to four or five different timeframes and then take a look at that. The problem is, is that you now need a much more intelligent overview system to start to look at confluence and dissonance um, amongst those, not just 
everything's equally weighted? Where, where do we have more clarity? Where do we have less clarity? Where do we have risk reward in terms of destinations, bigger risk reward versus something that's maybe offering a trade, but it's just in a condition that's been, let's say, rotational for the past week and a half, right? On a monthly or something. It, it's just so complicated. Yes, I believe that... If the smartest people in the world all got together and they really wanted to do it, they could do it, I think. I hope that that never happens. So anyways, we'll leave it at that. But um, practical advice on your question. Um, I suggest that you either really pursue that, that quantitative side, if that's where you come from and where your strengths are, or you begin to kind of embrace the fact that, look, you know, you don't have to be a quant to look at a chart that's going from the bottom left corner of the screen to the top right corner of the screen. You don't have to be a quant to say that's an uptrend, right? It could be a discretionary read. But if, if you work on the skill sets around the discretionary read, you bring it closer and closer to an objective place. So anyways, it's a great question. We could talk all day about it. Uh, when looking at order flow for intraday reversal points, what are some of the key things on the tape you look for? Um, capitulatory type stuff, um, big size that absorbs aggressive participants, um, weakening of a participant after it's been, after they have been in control, um, just a, a, a strong, back and forth shift, right? Like sellers really, really press hard. And then the buyers press really, really hard right back. So kind of like a, think about like a wick almost, right? Just, uh, you know, things like that for reversals on, on the tape. Hey, Merit, when monitoring uh, the younger traders on your desk, do you look at the average winning days, average losing days? If so, what kind of aspect can a trader work on to improve this ratio? Love this question. And yes, I absolutely look at this. Um, it's something that my own trading, when I was really trying, really struggling, I found it extremely hard for some reason to flip the ratio of average winning day and average losing day. I felt like I was a pretty good trader, but my losing days would just get out of hand and be bigger then my winning days, when I just absolutely had a great read, put the trade on, held it, you know, but I would typically scale out of some and hold a core position and like get a great run, um, you know, a runner. And I would make less on those days, as you can imagine, days where I essentially got into a fight with the market and tried an idea and it stopped me out and I tried it again and it stopped me out and I tried it again and it stopped me out. And then I took a break. And I came back and there was a contextual shift and I tried something else and I got to stop out, stop out, stop out, right? So that's like six stop outs, right? So let's just theoretically call it minus six R on a day where if you catch a really good trade and you scale out of half of it for two R and then the other half runs six R, right? Well, that's a net four R average per contract versus that 6R that you lost on a day where nothing worked. So I'm very um, sensitive to that issue, and it's certainly something that I look for. The very first thing that I look for is how good is the trader doing or how good am I doing or whoever with being intelligent about the spots that they pick. A lot of times it comes down to traders who are impatient in some way, and are early on entries. They get so excited about an idea that they start jumping the gun on it because of this like FOMO emotion that the trade might go without you. And it hasn't really set up yet. Whether that's a violation of acceptance, being anticipatory with our thinking of the narrative read, whether that is ignoring a good fundamentals of being in rhythm with our timing, our trades, that is taking... Um, several trades or re-entries when you know it's from the middle of DVA, right? All these basic NADRO mistakes that people make out of this fear-based trading, right? So 
ultimately it comes down to knowing the fundamentals, right? A lot of people don't truly internalize the fundamentals of those good trading mechanics that I just spoke of. Other people, fewer people, internalize them, but still screw it up based on that emotion that I talked about. And they it, ultimately, that comes down to motivations, right? What's your motivation for clicking the buy market button? And it has to be because you're compelled to, because your process says that this is a trade and you better have some risk on here. The time is now, right? So instead of being afraid that this market might run, let's say, higher without you having a trade on so you can profit, aka fear of missing out, what I want my traders to focus on is the fear believe it or not, of trading poorly. I want them to be way more motivated by the fear that I'm going to come after them for trading poorly and be disappointed in what they're doing than and that, that I want that to outweigh the fear of them missing out on some kind of potential move, right? So anyways, I got a little off topic there. Um, but. Uh, it's certainly a good stat as a basic, basic, basic stat to start to look for a decent ratio, right? It doesn't, you don't have to make eight times or you don't have to make four times as much on winning days as losing days. It's going to come down to style, but for let's call it a generic Nadro trader that's all in scale out. You start to get winning days that are time and a half, twice as big, two and a half times as big. You're getting to a really healthy place that you can that you can build from. Um, but if your average losing day is larger than your average winning day, it's it's a problem. And hopefully, some of those things that I mentioned um, resonate with some of you that you can you can go work on. Blair asked, when you talk about the previous day's value, is that based on market profile or previous day's VWAP? Blair, I thought you were a student of ours. Anyways, when I talk about that, it's always market profile. Uh, Sid says, how do you, Merit, use the TPO during the session? Do you look at each TPO close and assess the story that's unfolding, similar to how you recap DMI, or do you just keep a general idea of its shape, excess, et cetera? Um, so this is also definitely in the Nadro course. Um, it is a lesser, right, of, um, it's a lesser priority. The, the day's developing profile for me is in the hierarchy and the grand scheme of things, way less important than context, way less important than where yesterday's value was, right? So let's get that clear. There's a hierarchy involved. Um, from there, yes, I do keep an idea. Um, and I did this the other day, right? On, In fact, it was last Tuesday. Last Tuesday, I said, guys, this I period high is testing a really critical area. And look, we have excess at the highs here and a lack of excess on the lows. And sure enough, what happened from last Tuesday's Trader Tuesday, right? Go look at it. It was recorded in real time. That was the uh, uh, the afternoon high at that point that we talked about. And sure enough, we took out those lows. In fact, that ties in with the conversation that someone was asking about. Well, what about those shorts um, on Thursday? Wait, no, not third. What the, never mind. Sorry. The guy asked about Thursday. We're talking about Tuesday. Anyways, the point remains that there was some developing profile Within, most importantly, context, right? We had had an, a condition shift inside of a balance area. I period was retesting the high of that. Therefore, context was what was driving the show there. But then again, you step down the hierarchy. And what did I say? We have good excess on today's high and we have a poor low that can be taken out. So you combine those things within that proper view and hierarchy of, of priorities and you get some really good stuff. So I look for excess, lack of excess on the developing days profile. Uh, where is balance, right? Where is value relative to that balance? 
Um, but those are minor compared to the full toolkit. Uh, Balthazar says, I'm having trouble entering with the DVA the past two weeks, missing a lot of good narratives. Have you encountered the same issues or am I the issue? I don't know what you mean um, by having trouble entering with the DVA. I don't know what you mean. You know, that could be, is the trade being offered with DVA and you're having trouble pulling the trigger? Is it that the DVA doesn't look so great or it's like, you know, not offering the trade so that you're missing the overall entries because it just simply wasn't offered? Um, you know, so it really depends on what your, what your thought is there. So he's saying the DVA is not offering the trades or at least it's not clean. Um, yeah, I can't say that I relate. But my trading over the past couple of weeks has been very heavily around getting into some of these swing longs and then really kind of letting go. So I've been, let's say, caught up in some of the noise less than I would normally be or you might be finding yourself. So just because like of my lack of actively trading the DBA throughout the session um, based on me kind of getting in from good prices and letting stuff work and letting go, um, I actually I, I might not be the best person to ask about that. You could start a thread in the community and, and bring up some of the specific examples of, hey, I really wanted to be short the NASDAQ on this day. And the DVA, I just didn't find a way to get into this trade with the DVA. Is that the right? Is that the right move? Me passing on that because our intraday filter didn't offer it, or is there something you know maybe a more advanced way of doing things or thinking through DVA use? Maybe it's an ETH RTH thing you could begin to incorporate to give yourself a little more sample size of opportunity sets. Um, there's just a lot of directions we could go with that. All right, guys, great questions as always. Uh, it's always a pleasure to hang out with y'all, help however I can. You guys are such great thinkers and honest and just such a great community. I'm, I'm just so blessed to, to be a part of this. Um, so anyways, cheers, everybody. Have a great week, rest of the week. We will see y'all next week. Mm -hmm.